Okay, well, welcome again. Here we are. We're uh, looking at Genesis part 50, and we're in the midst of this pandemic related to this coronavirus. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are losing their lives through this, and we need to be in prayer for all those who are suffering at this time. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we can meet together. And uh, though we can't be in the hall, Lord, we can be on the internet, we can watch and learn and think, Lord, of the life that we have in Christ and the life that we have now and that which is to come through resurrection. We pray, Lord, for those that are unwell at this time, that you be with them and strengthen them and the families who are caring for them. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, we're in Genesis chapter 9. And uh, what I want to do now is I want to read a few verses from the ninth chapter, um, which has to do with Noah and his sons. And this chapter is kind of interesting because as you go right through the 29 verses, you find some amazing things. First of all, the introduction of this covenant and then the fact that Noah became a husbandman and he was uh, one who uh, planted a vineyard and he next thing of course he makes wine he becomes drunk and uh, various bad things happen after that and in the context a curse comes on Canaan and then finally in the last verse it says and all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died and death comes uh, by way of sin, that is, the death by sin came through Adam and then came into this, this world. And of course, Noah, even though he survived the watery judgment on the earth, nonetheless, in the end, he dies. So in Genesis chapter number 9, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that move upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. And, of course, uh, right after this flood, no doubt there would be a lot of pressure on the various forms of life uh, for food. Uh, and this was stated here in verse 2. In verse 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And we've discussed this when we were talked about this from the, the very first passages of Genesis. And it says, And surely your blood of your lives shall I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Of course, here is the death penalty, right? This is something that perhaps uh, we need to be really thinking about today uh, when it comes to murderers. My only uh, judgment here about this is that uh, while a person who is a murderer should die, we better make sure that that person is the murderer. We don't want to have someone executed who in fact is not the murderer, which unfortunately has taken place. And you, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Notice the word covenant. In Greek, it's diatheke. Diatheke. And so this first time that we get this strong mention of this covenant, I'm not saying that this is the first covenant, but this very, very strong mention, it makes us think about a question. Have we, that is the people who claim to be Christians, the people who take the scriptures and, and really stand by them, have we made a fundamental mistake? Have we taken the promises God gave originally to Israel and, of course, taken to, to ourselves those which belong to someone else? Now, when we look at Genesis, we don't see any Israel here, right? There's no Israel here. That's yet to come. And so it's very right, therefore, to say, well, these covenants uh, are not 
actually given to Israel, so uh, therefore they have application to us today. And I agree. I do agree with that. I think that's right. So as we come down here in, into Genesis uh, chapter 9 and then verse um, uh, 9, it says, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of the beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there, be, uh, shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Now I read all that because I think it's important that we get this. So, uh, what is largely agreed? I mean, there's a lot of disagreement about the covenants. But basically, I think there's large agreement that there's the Adamic covenant, there's the Noahic, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian the Mosaic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant. And if you look at these, um, if we were to emphasize these by putting a box around some of them, you'll notice that the box here, the gray box, has got um, the Abrahamic, Palestinian, Mosaic, David, and New Covenants together, and then these prior to that. Those prior to that, are prior to Israel, and its founding generation under Abraham, you find at the Adamic and the Noahic there. And of course, uh, the Adamic is interesting. The Noahic is interesting. The Noahic relates to punishment on the earth by way of water. The Adamic here is the death by sin. And then the answer to that in Genesis 3.15, which is the seed of the woman coming. And you see that mentioned here. What's even more interesting to me is to understand that Paul uh, relates back to that in his Acts epistle, uh, Romans uh, chapter number 16. So if you look, uh, you might say, well, does, does Paul ever mention things relating to the Adamic covenant? Well, uh, certainly directly in uh, one sense, indirectly in the sense that he doesn't mention that by name, but if you go to Romans 16 and uh, 25, it says this, Now to him that is power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. That is, a mystery which was silenced in age times, uh, but now is made manifest. So you can see the the neat dispensational expression, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, that is the prophetical scriptures, propheticon, which is an adjective, and it says the prophetical scriptures, and it goes on and says, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So this is cool. So if you, if you go back into the book of Romans, you find this mystery. Um, and this mystery is mentioned here in, in great length. It says this in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, now look at the expression, and death by sin. And then from there right through to the close of chapter 8, 
What do you have? Well, look at chapter 8, verse 39. It says, or 30, verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then what does it begin with? Next chapter, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I great that I have great heaviness and continual, continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse for my, for, from Christ my, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So what do you have? You have from Romans 5, verses 12, right to the end of chapter number 8, and chapter number 8 goes all the way to verse 39. Here you have a mystery and it goes right back to Adam. Yes, Adam, right back to this Adamic covenant. And here we have Paul elucidating how it is that in Christ, those that would formerly be dead and would be without hope for any life, but in Christ shall all be made alive. So life uh, coming through Christ. And nothing can separate us from the love of Christ which is through his finished work and we don't need to worry about principalities or powers or things present or things to come so that's a great doctrine so it's interesting that it goes all the way back there now i've got some snippets out to talk about mysteries right and how they pertain how they pertain to this idea of well what happens when israel begins to say no to God. What Does that mean that God's purposes are without effect? God has failed? No. What God will do is He will use Israel in their unbelief to achieve various purposes. And He will bring out mysteries of the kingdom. Mysteries related to His purposes and redemption. And He will do this very effectively using people's own uh, rebellion. And He will in fact harden those in order to achieve these more deeper purposes. If you look, for example, in Romans 11 and verse 24, it says, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, look at this, be graft into their own olive tree? Whoa, now what do you get from this? Well, the, the interesting thing about this idea of how God uses uh, mysteries and brings these things out during the time when Israel is in rebellion is that uh, there is a teaching held by many that there is this reprobate group that right before the foundation of the world, God chose one group to be the elect, another one the non-elect, non-elect, uh, uh, those reprobate and they have no option but to remain reprobate they have no salvation they cannot have salvation he's only going to share his love and his death of Christ on the cross with those of the elect but what do we have here this is such an interesting passage because it says here in verse 24 it says how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. Why, God, even although He uses people in their rebellion, that is the nation of Israel, specifically here in Romans 11, it doesn't mean to say that He has given up on them. Oh, that's the reprobate. Leave them alone. No, He wants to see them grafted back in again. Why, we can see all of this even happen out in the life of Paul, Paul, who was the leader of the rebellion. So I find this kind of interesting, that you find this connection in the scriptures. So the covenants are there, and they're very interesting. Um, if you look at this, when we talk about Paul the prisoner, what are we finding? We're finding Paul the prisoner is given a revelation before the foundation of the world, man. So here is the catapole, the overthrow of the world. Back here, God had a plan and purpose, which he hid in himself. He kept it away from Noah. 
He kept it away from Adam. He kept it away from all of the prophets. And then at just the right time, he released it to Paul, the prisoner. And to him, this mystery was given. And then finally, to us, through our reading of the scriptures and rightly dividing the word of truth, we come to understand this great truth that was given to Paul. Now, what about the covenants? Well, the covenants have nothing to do with this. These covenants have nothing at all to do with the great secret which was given to Paul, Ephesians chapter 3, Colossians 1 and 2. People today, of course, what they'll do is they'll take things out of the covenants to try and address and bring them into this age. So one of the big problems we have in our churches and within Christianity in general is that we have promises, we have covenants that were clearly given to Israel and what people do today is, in, in our age, what they do is they grab these and they try and make them fit. Have you seen kids playing with these little blocks and stuff, you know, they, and uh, there's square holes and there's round holes and there's star-shaped holes, you know, and you're given all these different shaped blocks and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to fit them in there. And some of the kids, you know, it takes a little bit of time at the and trying to get the square block and put it in a round hole and they'll do it and then finally, oh yeah, this goes in here, that goes in there, that goes, yeah, and finally they fit. They get, they get to work this out and they put them in the wrong place. But what I think's going on is that people today, what they're doing is they're taking things that were given to Israel and they're trying to bring them in, they're trying to fit square things into round holes. That's what they're trying to do. Well, round things into square holes, and it's not going to work. Now, if I just bring you a little bit further on here, these, uh, these are passages where you'll find New Covenant mentioned. And you'll notice that, that the New Covenant is mentioned, first of all, in Jeremiah 31, 31. And I think it's good for us to, to realize this, that way back there in the... Old Testament, what you find is you have passages that were written to the nation of Israel and they pertain to things uh, concerning the new covenant. Now, the Jeremiah 31, 31 is one of them. I want you to see in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Let's just read there. So in Matthew 26... And in verse 28, it says this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, that diatheke, sometimes translated testament, sometimes covenant, of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That's interesting, isn't it? Taking from verse 26, so Matthew 26, 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take heed, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. These cups are well known to the Jews. This is totally in conformity with the Jewish tradition. Okay? And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Oh, well, wait a minute. Now, the context here. Are you trying to import into this passage... Are you trying to import into this passage the mystery that was given to Paul the prisoner? Don't you agree with me that the context of this has to do with the new covenant blessings given to Israel? Not to the Gentiles, but to Israel. Let's just confirm that by going back to Jeremiah 31. Look at this. Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet of Israel. Jeremiah 31 and... Verse 31, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
Do you see Gentiles in their people? It says, house of Israel and house of Judah. The context of Matthew 26 is Messiah coming to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel rejecting him and then he using their rejection in order that he'd be put on the cross and die for their sins, that in fact they would be brought back to him. He didn't have some reprobate group that uh, he was not going to die for. Rather, he did this, he used them in their rebellion, that he might even save them. Okay, so you find this here in Matthew 26 and 28, the New Covenant. Well, there's plenty more passages, but I want you to go across to 1 Corinthians 11. So let's just see how this is, this is working out here. I'm just going to diagram it here. So what do we have going on here? Well, I'll just remove some of this to, to make a bit of room here. Okay, cool. So what we have is we have uh, this going on. We have this back here in Matthew 26, 28. Yeah, we have the Lord's Supper, and it's within the context of the New Covenant. Why the cup with the wine in it represented, of course, the blood of the New Covenant. That's what it was. You can't change the context, friend. Don't do it. Take what God has given you. So then we have the cross, and then Paul is saying, we have the Pentecost here, then we have the salvation of Paul and his commission, who up till then was uh, fighting against the purpose of God ignorantly and in unbelief. And then what, he ha he, what happens to him in chapter 9 is that he is brought and turned around by an appearance of Christ to him, and off he goes, and he starts preaching. And he writes, for example, in 1 Corinthians, and chapter number 11, verse 25, he talks about this same doctrine. Let's have a look at it. So we're trying to put things in some kind of order, right? 1 Corinthians, chapter number 11, he says this. Um, and verse, well, let's read back up a little bit further. <clears throat> he talks about how that the the people there in Corinth, the assembly, they had, well, a lot of sins. I mean, some terrible stuff was going on there. But one of the sins they had was that they were treating this time when the Lord's Supper was supposed to be instituted and where the Lord's death was to be remembered through this. They were having a party. And he's trying to straighten them out on this because he says this, um, verse 18, 1 Corinthians 11, 18, for, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be division among you, and I partly believe it, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And this is one of the neat things about a heresy. You have the opportunity as a believer to straighten it out and to stand by the stuff. And it says, um, uh, verse 20, When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Man, can you imagine this? This is an assembly where people are coming, bringing a real eaten meeting, and they're drunk at the same time. And they're going to try and suppose that they are, they're offering the Lord's Supper. And it says, uh, verse 21, For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper. Verse 22, What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? <laughs> or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord. Now here it comes. Look at this. I want you to see something going on here which is very important because Paul says, I have received of the Lord. Now is he talking now about the mystery? Of course not. He goes on. He says this. He says this. 
For I have received the law, verse 23, 23, that which also I delivered unto you, okay, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Okay, so this institution of an ordinance comes directly from the time back here. And this reception that Paul got, this doctrinal statement is in total conformity to what you read previously in the Gospels. And he says, verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now look at this. First of all, Paul is establishing the connection of the Lord's Supper with the New Covenant. He says he received the Lord and he talks about the, the, the time of his betrayal and all the events during that time in, the, in respect of the Lord's Supper, and he's now instituting the same. Right? The same. Very clearly, it's a continuation. And he goes on in verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Now, he's not using the word parousia here, but he's talking about the coming of the Lord in the same context that you read about back here in Matthew 26 and 3rd and Matthew 24, as it stated, the parousia. Now, we have read here about the parousia, that it's conditional. It's conditional on Israel's repentance. Now, what do people say? Well, they say, we are, we are to keep this till he come. Till he come. But they don't ask, but what's the context of him coming here? Till he come. The, the context here is that the Apostle Paul was in this condition of saying, yes, Jesus Christ is going to come subject of, to Israel's repentance. So subject to Israel's repentance, the Lord would come. That's in this. That's in this context. Now the question is, did Israel repent? And the answer is, no, they did not repent. Well then, till he come is now in that context, and you cannot take it out of that context. To take it out of that context and put it in a man today is to deny what subsequently happened. Don't try and deny what subsequently happened, which is the revelation of the mystery, man. And therefore, you've got a break, a disjuncture here. Not a continue. All this is a continuation, right? When you read Paul's Acts epistles, you get a continuation of the same teaching Paul talks about in this context. Why, these same people, right in this context, are involved with the signs and wonders. They had an anointing, just like John talked about. If you go across to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, look what it says in verse uh, 21. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21. Now, he which establish us, us with you in Christ and hath, look at this, anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. And what's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about the fact that there are promises that were given to the nation of Israel, and that during this time, there was this confirmation 
of the truth, in terms of the giving of the, of the Spirit and this great anointing that God gave them. There was an anointing here which related to signs and wonders and all these things were part of this thing. My question to you, my friends, is are you going to take the message of God in terms of right division or are you going to try and force a continuation of God's ministry to the nation of Israel and try and take that and force it onto yourself today? Or are you going to take the revelation which was specially purposed for us in this age? So if you look at Hebrews, let's go across to the book of Hebrews. Let's see what else we can find about this thing. You know, when people talk about the New Testament and they say, well, when you come to the New Testament, everything's changed. You know, uh, the New Testament uh, gives you a message which relates to the nations as well as Israel. Well, look at this. Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse uh, 8 says this. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Looks like the writer of Hebrews, speaking to the Hebrews, is confirming the same message. It is a new covenant message. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So what people are these? Who was it that God took by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt? Was it the Gentiles? No, of course not. It wasn't the Gentiles. It was the nation of Israel. That's the context of the new covenant. And the Lord's Supper is intimately associated with the terms of the new covenant. Okay, cool. And it says this in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be, I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Oh, this is the time of refreshing. This is the time when Israel will repent. And just as uh, God took them out, right? He took them out of Egypt. He was a husband unto them and he took them by the hand he brought them out of the land of Egypt finally we find that he divorces them but later on he's going to wash them clean and he's going to bring them back to himself and there will be a great marriage supper of the land right a great marriage is coming and you say well he can't take back the wife that he has divorced according to the law. Yeah, but what if he washes them so completely that they are effectively a new woman? How's that? That's possible, isn't it? It's possible that God could do that. Okay, so this is really interesting. Here I've got the, the coming and I've pointed out the fact that the parousia is mentioned these 24 times. 17 of these refer to Christ and then seven to others, including Paul and Titus and Stephanus and even Antichrist as well. But there are 17 references that relate to the coming of Christ. And this has to do with prophecy. Prophecy. Wherever you've got a reference that talks about the coming of Christ, it relates to prophecy, a very important thing to realize. So the Lord's Supper is an interesting thing, but it, mu it must be stated that it has a special relationship to the new covenant for which we do not have a part. We have something greater. And what do we find today? We, pe we find people taking the Lord's Supper, trying to put it on people that were never given the new covenant. They take the baptisms of Israel and they try and put it on people today. They take the various laws that were given to Israel and they try and put it on people today. It is a complete mismatch and we should not allow it in our preaching. We must bring forth the proclamation of this truth. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today and the, the truth that is in here concerning the covenants 
the mystery given to Paul the prisoner, which uh, comes after and supersedes all these things, and uh, that we as members of the one body, we can proclaim this truth and be thankful for the salvation we have in Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.